Today we're going to hear from some of the persons who are actively involved in Occupy Kansas City who are trying to help, help the 99% speak. We have four people here today on our panel. We have Mike, Wesley, Amy, and Rosemary. And I put up signs with their names. So later when we open things up, to questions from the audience, if you want to address to a particular person or everybody, you can indicate that. The Occupy movement started in September 2011 in Wall Street, at least in the U.S. That's where I think of it as starting. And it very quickly spread as there was solidarity from all kinds of other persons. I thought it was a good idea if we knew what was going on with Occupy Kansas City. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pose a question and ask each one in turn to respond, and then I'll pose another question. And after some of this, then we'll have take up an offering and then open up to questions from the audience. So my first question to each person, and we'll just start with Mike, uh, is can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to be involved with Occupy Kansas City, and then what working group are you with? And We'll, we'll be able to pick up a little bit about the organization that they have. So, Mike, can you start? Uh, good morning. My name is Mike. My personal involvement, I became involved in like if I, uh, I grew up during the time of the 60s during the Civil Rights and Vietnam War, so I've had a lot of political issues at a young age. Watched my father work hard, be able to raise a family. And corporate influence in our politics it's real dear to me, so I can probably represent an opportunity for me to be able to address those needs personally. I represent a group called Town Planning, which is our actual encampment and how our occupiers and the camp issues as they relate to our movement. I'm sorry, could you repeat the name of your group? I represent Town Planning, which are town is, planning. Town, which, uh, which are consists of our physical occupiers, the encampment. Hi, I'm Wesley Brockman. Um, I'm in the direct action work group. Um, I guess my involvement came, I've uh, always been pretty politically uh, interested, and so for you know 10 or 15, maybe 20 years, I've been watching a lot of these issues and a lot of uh, things going on. And uh, so when the Occupy movement started, I was really pretty excited. I mean, I was like freaking out, really, like I won the lottery. You know, I was like pacing around my house, driving my uh, kids and girlfriend nuts, you know, just talking about these things because it's finally like there's a, a group of people that were interested in the same things that I'd been interested in and felt pretty lonely about, you know, uh, for you know, 10 or 20 years. So I was pretty excited when it started. And, uh, and yeah, that's how I kind of went down and met people at the camp and started getting active with it. Well, my name is Amy and I'm with the Media Working Group. And I think I've also managed to drive those close to me. Um, I, I think I've also managed to drive those close to me uh, to the brink of insanity with my level of involvement. Um, I also felt like I won the lottery. Uh, I felt like I've been waiting for this for a long time. This is the first time I've really felt that I had a voice. Um, and I'm in the media working group, uh, mainly because that's just where I felt that I could contribute the most. Um, I don't really have any special skills, um, but longevity. And I do a lot of small, everyday stuff. Um, so. Good morning, I'm Rosemary Woods. Excuse me. <clears throat> I'm with the education working group, and like my uh, fellow Occupy people here, when I heard about this, I went crazy because I hadn't heard about things like this since the 70s. I was all ready for it. Uh, if I would have had the money, I would have driven to Madison, Wisconsin. I think that, along with the eventual Wall Street movement, is what really got people in this country awake to the fact that not only has the wealth disparity bought our country, but it's taken our power away. It occupies one way that I feel we can take that power back. 
it appears that you're you're spending different amounts of time on this, ranging from Mike, you say that you're one of the persons who's basically living there, is that correct? That's correct. Could, could each of you just say a little bit about say a little bit more about yourself, like about how much time you spend there and how you try to balance this with other kinds of things that you're doing. Some of you may be working, some of you may have families, some of you may be volunteers, and some of you may be able to spend full time on this. Could you tell us a little bit, each one of you, about what you're trying to balance all of this with? Well, currently, I'm a full-time occupier. My uh, day job is, I work with a private contractor, so it's kind of sporadic. 75% of my time is spent at the camp addressing camp issues as far as uh, cleanliness, uh, maintaining structure, organization. I seem to do pretty well at finding time outside of that to during the day hours when I when I do work. But most of my, my evening hours are spent doing uh, involvement in other group activities and major, I guess primarily maintaining camp issues. Um, balancing is a, is a good uh, question. With the, yeah, um, I have two daughters and I work full time, so sometimes uh, it gets pretty hard to like, balance out because it seems like there's never um, enough time to uh, do all the things with Occupy I'd like to. So the first couple months of it, I really kind of threw myself into it and I took a lot of time off work and got really behind on bills, so I had to like, find a way to balance that out. But uh, my kids are really understanding with it. I brought them down to the camp. I, I took them to some of the general assemblies. You know, I, I don't camp there. Like Mike, uh, I don't think my ex-wife would be super excited if I was to have my girls there on school nights camping there. But uh, we go down there and they've seen some of the general assemblies and, and they like it. I just wanted them to see kind of when I'm not with them, what I'm doing, you know, so they know it's not like, a, we're not doing like keg stands or parties or anything, you know, we're actually working on stuff. And, and I wanted them to have a, an experience with uh, like participatory democracy, you know, kind of see, because that's something that's kind of, you know, removed from our everyday experience, you know, even with voting, it's kind of arguable how participatory that is. But, you know, to see, you know, the good and the bad of a group of people trying to work together and work out issues, you know, sometimes it's painful, you know, sometimes it's, uh, you know, it can be real aggravating, but it's also the way it should work too, you know, where you have all these, people with different experiences that all can kind of come together around some shared grievances and work out issues and I think that was important for them to see. So I, uh, I spend, uh, I don't know, hours wise, but I spend a good amount of my free time, definitely. My free time has been almost totally evaporated by Occupy, but it's something that I find very fulfilling so I don't think uh, it's a bad thing really. Yeah, when all this started, I pretty much dropped everything else that I was doing. Um, and I wasn't working at the time anyway, so that just meant that I could spend even more time. I, I feel like we're making up for lost time, in a way. Um, I it, it is hard to find a balance. I've actually tried to step back a little bit. Um, but it's hard to only be a little involved, because there's always something new and exciting to work on. Um, so yeah, we could use more people, by the way. So <laughs> it, it, anyone who wants to come and get involved doesn't have to spend all of their time doing it. Um, I do because it's the only thing I, I want to work on almost. Um, it's just that important to me. And I work part time. Sometimes it's five days a week, sometimes it's one day a week I teach. So when I'm not teaching, and fortunately I live close to the Occupy site, I do spend a lot of time up there. I have not as yet camped out. I also take my dog, that's my four-legged child. I try to spend as much time as possible because like the others, this is something that's very important to me. It's important because it's it's corporate wealth, it's usurping of our power and our democracy, but it touches every other issue, whether it's the environment, whether it's health care, whether it's jobs, it, the underlying root is there's too much money and too few hands. And I got involved with education because I teach.
teach and I like to learn. And it's, it's also about my learning as much as about my teaching. So I do try to spend as much time up there as I can. And I'll echo what Amy said. Stop by. We like to meet people. Well, following up on what Rosemary Murray was saying about some of the issues, could each of you talk about a little bit about some of the issues that are especially important to you and what are your hopes of what will happen in that area? Um, yeah, I, you know, Occupy is kind of a horizontal movement, so I can't speak for Occupy at large, you know, because we all, uh, there's no real leaders and we all kind of come to consensus. But I, can, I think I can say with confidence that one of the issues, at least with Occupy Kansas City, is the issue of racism we try to address and like the racial divide because as long as people see, you know, with prejudice and not just racism but all issues of inequality, but, uh, you know, as long as, you know, we have those divisive issues then it's hard for people to identify themselves as a larger whole, you know, as part of the 99%. So, especially um, the dynamic in Kansas City is particular just because it's one of the most racially segregated cities in the country. So that's something we've tried to address in, um, in the direct action work group is try to take, you know, some of the rallies or marches we've had have gone into, you know, like Northeast Kansas City, which is a really, you know, diverse part of the city, or to Truce Park. So, you know, really try to work on issues like ra racism and stuff and, you know, kind of bring people's awareness to it. Especially, you know, a lot of people of color, their, their lives are kind of disproportionately affected by a lot of issues, you know, if, uh, like unemployment is like 9%, you know, in the country, but for blacks and Latinos, it's, it's about double that, you know, so we try to bring awareness to issues like that. I mean, there's lots of issues we tackle, but that's one that I personally, and I think a, a lot of the, the rest of the panel up here would agree is something we all feel is really important. Uh, <clears throat> well, obviously, being an African-American racist, always have been a very important issue with me. My hopes for uh, the perpetuation of this movement, I, I believe, is that people can go to not see race as a, a defining issue in our lives. We're all community. The world is community. So my hopes would be that people can, we can grow that mentality to spread amongst all genders and races. To me, the single most important issue, as far as why I'm here, is probably electoral and campaign finance reform. I feel that our voice has slowly been taken away from us, bit by bit, over the last decades. That we don't really have much of a role in our own democracy anymore. It's not really a democracy anymore, it's a plutocracy, uh, or an oligarchy, or however you want to call it. So that, that's the most important thing to me. Um, and then there's the, the prison industrial complex, the military industrial complex, um, the so-called nation building that we go and do all over the world, um, our civil liberties, um, the state of our media, which is closely related to our, that original thing that I said, uh, electoral reform. Um, it's basically used as a, a tool, I feel, and it also has been consolidated into the hands of a few, and um, that's part of why I'm in the media working group, because to me this is an exercise in, in what media should be like. It should be the voice of the people, um, to the people, and, and then education to it. With the time I spend thinking about these issues, why we're here, uh, it always comes back to one thing, and it's education. and so. I think the education working group is, is really important and that's a really important issue. I will echo what the rest of the community says. Dovetailing right on racism is poverty. This East of Truth, I just feel for people over there because they're a food desert, which brings me to one of my main issues, the environment which affects everybody regardless of whether you're in the 99% and are African American or the 1% and are something else. If we don't take care of our environment, which also has been usurped by big money, none of us are going to survive. Do you guys know what this means? Yeah. 
Oh. Would you want to feedback? Please feel free to uh, express how you feel about what we're saying. If you if you feel so so about it, and if you don't like it, <laughs> if you like your hands up. That, that's our kind of cultish. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Well, maybe this would be a good time to explain a little bit more about how your different groups work, how you govern uh, the the mic, the, the you know the kind of person being the mic kind of thing. Could you give us kind of fill us in on on some of those details of things? Uh, well, it's it's uh, it's very fluid. It's very dynamic. Um, our our process that we use to organize ourselves has evolved a lot since the beginning. Um, what we call the process is um, a system that was, I think, kind of originally, it's an old thing, but uh, um, the General Assembly of, of Spain, I think, kind of codified it, and then Occupy Wall Street moved forward with it a little bit, and we've, we've taken that model and used it uh, amongst ourselves. Um, we uh, try to reach consensus on things, on our decisions, which means that we try to come to an agreement that is acceptable to everyone, um, meaning that we take dissent into account and compromise and talk about things until we find something that is acceptable, rather than the simple majority, you know, where as long as you can get 51% of the vote, then you win. Um, our, our working groups, uh, their organization is kind of left up to themselves, and they're not that large, so it's been pretty <coughs> informal. Um, I think there's usually uh, between eight and eight and fifteen people in media, and um, we try to just take turns and respect each other's time to speak. It, it really varies depending on the, the number of people and the subject matter that we're trying to address. And all the working groups are open too, so you know anybody from the movement can join any working group. So it's not like any working group has any more say over, you know, kind of the actions we take or kind of the, the movement we go in, since they're all open, you know, that anybody can be part of it and part of the consensus process. And that's one thing that's really important to us is just the openness, you know, and so you don't have a, an individual or a few individuals kind of, you know, taking their agendas, you know, taking the whole movement in their direction. So since everything has to go through consensus, then you really have to work on compromising. And like I said before, you know, that can be a frustrating process sometimes, but it's also an important part of it, too, to all of us. And it's uh, it's one of the beneficial parts of the movement at, at large, you know, because it's, uh, you can't, you know, I mean, some movements have a charismatic leader that can rally people, but then you can, you know, find out that person did something terrible, or, you know, if they get assassinated, then the movement fizzles, but, you know, so we have, you know, uh, 300 million charismatic people in the United States that can be part of this, and, and in the world at large, too. I mean, I, I don't see Occupy as just, uh, you know, a uh, national thing. I think it's truly, you know, there's uh, Occupy Nigeria, you know, that I heard about starting a couple weeks ago, and I was pretty excited about that. So it, it's good to feel solidarity with with people in remote places, you know, I, especially with a lot of xenophobia with the Middle East, you know, like I feel a more connectedness with, uh, our brothers and sisters in Egypt, you know, because we're both kind of out in the streets protesting these issues, and I, I think that's one of the, the greatest parts of uh, the Occupy movement, too. Well, me, must, <clears throat> me myself, being part of the, uh, being part of the occupiers, and being part of town planning, it's obviously important to us. We're not a camp ourselves. We are activists in camp. And that, I believe, distinguishes us from a regular camp. Uh, my contribution is to assist in the enforcement of our code of conduct, our daily operations, our camp needs, as they relate to our movement. And I believe our encampment is an integral part of where we are at this point as a movement. So we like to try to represent that image that we perceive to other people when they come up and first meet us then our encampment is the first thing they see before they even get a chance to speak with any one person so my contribution is to assist our encampment of being involved more involved in our working groups our actual political movement and one thing 
I want to mention is we're not limited to just one working group. I'm also in direct action, and we've started Tent City University, which is sort of like Tom University, and that's getting off the ground. So people can join multiple working groups. Yes, it takes time, so you have to balance, juggle your time commitment and your priorities. One thing I want to mention with the General Assembly, for example, if the Direct Action Working Group comes up with a proposal for an action, that is then taken to the General Assembly. And then it's voted on. If we get consensus, fine. If we don't, it's reworked and we bring it back. All working groups work that way. There's also individual proposals. I would encourage people, if you have time, to come up and uh, just see a General Assembly. There's Sunday evenings, Tuesday evenings, and Thursday evenings at 6.30 at the camp. Well, I have a question of the audience. How many of you have ever been, have been down at all to the uh, Occupy Kansas City site? We are one of the few remaining uh, encampments, physical occupations in the country, I believe. So if you haven't been yet, it's a uh, tie time. <laughs> I just want to mention, it's been about a week and a half. Fire Dog Lake, the website does have a list of all the physical encampments left. They also have donations and they do a lot for the physical campers. When I checked, there were 62. I know that Occupy DC has been removed. So there's probably about 60 campsites left in the country, physical campsites. How do you feel you have been treated by the local police, by the local media, by the community in general? Um, I mean, there's, a, there's definitely some contention between the police and us. I feel like uh, the mayor probably, whether he says so outwardly, probably has, you know, supports us, I would imagine, because we haven't been removed. Um, it's kind of a double-edged double sword, our location. Like, for one, we're kind of out of the way. You know, if we were camping on J.C. Nichols Fountain, we would have been gone the first day, I'm sure, because <laughs> that's a plaza. But, uh, so we, you know, it, it's good because we've, we've stayed out of the, you know, public's, you know, spotlight for the most part, because you really have to go try to find it. But, uh, but in, also it's helped us because we have been able to stay there, you know, it, it's a, uh, and then, I mean, all of us would agree that the movement would continue if, if we got, uh, you know, closed down. But it is still kind of good that the um, the camp is there. You know, it's, it, it is a, a sit-in in a way. You know, the um, since, you know, all of these grievances, a lot of them have to do with kind of big money and politics. It's not like we can go sit in at AT&T or Bank of America and, you know, address kind of all of our issues. So since, you know, our issues are kind of systemic, then it is an informed, uh, a sit-in of public space to protest all of those things. So it's not just camping, you know, it's a, it is a protest, a sit-in protest. But a, as far as our relation with the cops, um, you know, they haven't uh, hassled us too much, but then the last rally we had, we they told us definitely we couldn't march in the street or we would be arrested. So it's hard to say at uh, some point, you know, whether we will kind of have to butt heads and people will get arrested or, you know, with an action or not. So it's kind of something that's evolving over time, I would imagine. And I'm sure there's some national pressure too, you know, like a, a lot of the first raids on all the camps were really coordinated, you know, with um, the mayor of uh, Oakland kind of let it slip that she was on a conference call with like 20 other cities or something, you know, so it was kind of a national coordinated effort to, uh, that means dislike, to, uh, to bust up a lot of the camps, especially the bigger ones, you know, like uh, in New York and, and Oakland and stuff like that, so. In, in the interest of time, I won't um, go into my own feelings about the camp um, beyond the fact that I, it, it's symbolically, it's huge. It's a fundamental part of the occupation. Um, but she asked also about uh, the media 
And one of the reasons that we find it so important to get the word out about ourselves is because traditional mainstream media has pretty much utterly failed us. Uh, they seem to have two modes that, uh, you know, ignore us and uh, you know, panic or something. Um, <laughs> they, they just don't get it. <laughs> the, the, the best article that I've seen written about us that really caught the essence of this movement was, I believe, written by a high schooler, um, the Shawnee Mission East Har Harbinger, Harbinger um, newspaper, I don't know. Uh, but, uh, you know, just the other day, after I had a brief phone interview with somebody from the Star, where I specifically said that, you know, I'm not speaking on anyone's behalf but my own, uh, you know, we, we don't have representatives, uh, this is just me talking. Uh, he then went and called me a spokeswoman for the movement and the article, and it's just like, you don't listen. So that's, that's part of why um, we try really hard to uh, represent our message in a way that's understandable and accurate. If you could look ahead 10 years, what, would you, what changes would you like to see have happened? You can dream now. <laughs> I don't know if I'll be around in 10 years, I hope so. But what I would like to see is more people looking at one another, we're all in this together, that it's not divided, that yeah, we may have issues with certain belief systems, that's fine. But be more, be, to be more accepting of each other and our viewpoints, also to be more concerned about our voice in government, whether it's at the national, the state, or the local level. And please, let's not trash our environment anymore, because if we do, none of us are going to be around in 10 years. I want to really see that come out, because all of the other issues are extremely important, but this is our life. For me, <clears throat> I would like to see a time in a utopian world where our elected officials truly address the true needs of the people. Yeah, I would, I would echo, echo both of those. I mean, um, I would like to think it would happen in 10 years. Uh, you know, if I was, uh, had my wish, for sure, you know, to, to see that our government really and our elected officials really address the needs of working people and working families. And uh, you know, if we got uh, money out of politics and they started to address us, I think a lot of these issues would fall in line. I mean, a, a lot of the environmental destruction is because we have corporations that it's not their economic interest to care about the environment. You know, when you have a you know a, a solely profit-driven system, um, then the common good kind of falls by the wayside. So I, I would like to see a return to um, people addressing the common good, you know, what's good in the, in the long term. You know, our, our society is very, our gov at least our government, which has been bought by, you know, huge corporations, is very short term, bottom line, you know, that doesn't really address um, any of the effects on the environment, on working people, um, all of these things. And I think, you know, as a start, if we got, you know, the money out of politics, then it could be a return to what are issues of common good. Anyway. Um, I share most of those. So in addition to those, I, I would really, in 10 years, like to, like there not to be this two-party system anymore. Um, it, you know, it would be a, a system where we actually talk about issues uh, rather than, you know, use rhetoric and, and uh, degrade each other, where we respect each other. Uh, in our conversations on every level of society. Um, it would be a, a system where people are allowed to provide for themselves. Um, so rather than talking about, oh, well, what, do, what do we do about the homeless problem, um, we will have moved beyond asking why is there homelessness and, and found solutions to where people can provide for themselves. Um, it would be a situation where um, the schools are, are full and we're building schools, but the prisons, on the other hand, are empty and we're closing those. And, yeah. <laughs>
basically, I would just like our system to be a lot more participatory um, and open and transparent. Well, let's, let's take up our offering now, and we'll, we'll now go ahead with questions from the audience. Can I just add oh, one more thing? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't catch you there. That's okay. I will try to be very brief. The wars, the military-industrial complex, and the best way for me to put it is, we need to find a way to make peace profitable. <laughs> For our question and answer portion, the, the rules that we have is please come to the mic. We are having this recorded for, for usual broadcast on KKFI a couple of weeks later when the forum is usually quite then. So please talk into the mic and please one question, one question per person and questions and not statements. Now they are going to be available in the library for a little while afterwards and that's a time to have somewhat more um, the discussion then, but, but right now please just uh, a relatively short question and you can either address it to the entire panel or the individual person or you may address it to one and others want to uh, add on. Well, if I can't make a statement, uh, I guess I don't have anything to say. <laughs> Turn your statement into a question. That's, we, we've become proficient on that. I would like a response to it though and, and it seems to me that you know, you're all talking about what you want in 10 years and, and uh, um, the primary fact that you put forward is the 1% versus the 99%. I have no quarrel with that. I mean, this is about wealth distribution. Wealth is power, and power is uh, what prevails. Uh, and, and yet, when you talk about the 10, in, in 10 years, nobody said, we want to redistribute some wealth. Nobody said that. Can you address that? I, I think if we could get... Uh, the money out of politics, then a lot of that would maybe naturally flow from that, you know, because uh, a lot of that concentrated wealth has bought our um, elected officials, you know, since Reagan or before, and so we've seen like a massive decline, you know, and, and a lot of that is because you have these uh, groups that buy lobbies, you know, they have lobbies, there's like uh, one in particular called ALEC, AL. DC that we have an action coming up with, and it's a, it's a definitely one that you know they write legislation and then they take money and they buy uh, you know elected officials and they represent their interests and they get a lot of special treatment. So I think if you know, and it, it depends on what your view is, and we try not to get too much into like identity politics, I guess, um, as far as like whether you're you know a socialist or a communist or social democrat or anarchist, but I think just naturally if you could kind of give money out of politics and the politics then represented the, the people, then you would have a redistribution of wealth naturally from that. It wouldn't be consolidated at the top. But I think whether we said it or not, I think that's definitely, you know, all, something all of us would agree on is uh, it definitely needs to be re redistributed. If I can weigh in on that, um, I, I think that the wealth is already being redistributed uh, to the top, um, like a vacuum that's been sucking it all up, but in a very sneaky way, not just with dollars, um, but the way money is being introduced into our economy uh, is making the money that we have worth less, so we can buy less with it. Our savings are being um, <coughs> depleted, not, not in the number of dollars, but in what those dollars can buy. So, uh, and I'd love to talk to you more about that in the library, maybe. Okay, um, I know you're part of a larger national movement, but I want to ask you uh, specifically the Kansas City occupation. Are you a revolution? And if you are, what's the most revolutionary thing that's happening? And can you tell us some stories or you know, examples of how you think it really is a revolution? It is. Um, I would, again, I'm speaking for myself because I'm not a spokesperson for the movement at large, but I would say there's already a revolution has begun. If you look at uh, a lot of the kind of salience of a lot of issues, you know, with, there's these uh, conversations that are happening around the water coolers at work and around coffee tables at home, you know, where you talk about issues like in, income inequality 
and uh, economic injustice and you know just that all of us I can say the 99 percent and everybody in here pretty much knows what that means and six months ago that wasn't a fact you know that wasn't something people talked about I mean uh, Mitt Romney's tax return is an issue now. I don't know if that would have been an issue last year. So there's been a revolution of ideas and a revolution of conversation. And just, I'm not advocating, I don't help the move hard. Um, so I, I do think there is a revolution just in the way people are starting to identify themselves, I would imagine. I'm going to dovetail on that. I agree with Wesley. Revolutions don't have to be guns and fighting. And I think the biggest point is the revolution not only of ideas, but the revolution of actually talking about the real issues, bringing those to the forefront. That's a pretty big revolution. And, and the fact that if, if we can't cause the system to be changed, then we will make our own. Um, I think that is the biggest part of the revolution for me is that we don't have to use what they are giving to us. Uh, you know, we can make our own internet, uh, our own forms of communication, our own ways of organizing ourselves, uh, <coughs> our own barter systems, our own forms of money. Uh, you know, and it, it doesn't have to be violent. <coughs> Me personally, I believe the revolution just started just just by the simple fact that such a diverse group of people can come together. Most of the folks that I, I know now were strangers to me 129 days ago. And just the fact that so many diverse people can come together and be on one accord and be dedicated to that cause, I think the revolution started. so much for coming and thanks for what you're doing. I'm so proud of thanks for Occupy me. Kansas City. My question is, how are <laughs> you, uh, how are you connecting with other groups, both fairly close, I'm thinking like Kansas and you know, fairly close arms, places around you. And how are you connecting internationally? Uh, how and how can we help you do that? Or I just think it's so important. I, and right now, particularly, I'm scared to death Israel is going to get. Have you got a group over there in the Middle East? That's what I want to know. And thank you for coming to our marches, by the way. Yeah. It's, it's wonderful to see you there, and, and you know this this intergenerational communication to me is, is just as important as the geographical communication and, and collaboration. Um, do we have a group in, in Israel? Uh, well, you know we're not really a group, uh, I don't think, uh, or an organization. We are. Uh, the, this is a, a way of life. This is a way of thinking. A way of interacting. Um, so yes, I mean there are occupiers all over the world. It, it's it's about a mindset, um, and also and I'm so glad you asked this because we are uh, in the process of putting together a way for organizations, you know, not not occupy organizations, but uh, Mary Lindsay's around here somewhere, um, and and she's a fabulous liaison between Move to Amend and, and us and. We're always looking for people who can do that. So any any other group that you're in, um, if you can come and, and be in the occupation as well, that link is uh, is great. And the more of those that we have, the stronger we are. Uh, we're like a, a web, a spider web, I think. And, and that's something we've kind of uh, really tried to focus on too, is coalition building. You know, especially with groups that are uh, like-minded. You know, groups that take issues of inequality and. Uh, economic injustice seriously and uh, you know like I'm very happy to be here today and you know make connections with people here uh, we've worked with uh, veterans for peace uh, peace works uh, I don't know if there's any peace works people in the house but um, yeah so we you know and, and we have so much in, in common that it's only natural that we would work together and if you look at like the civil rights movement the civil rights movement 
was made up of, you know, you had liberal whites, you had the labor movement, you had a uh, faith-based movement, um, the anti-war movement, and they all kind of came together around these issues of civil rights. And in a lot of ways, I see the Occupy movement as kind of carrying the torch from that, you know, not, not everything that we wanted to happen in the civil rights, you know, was accomplished. And so there's definitely, you know, still ground to be made there. So we, we have been connecting with other groups. Uh, CCO, I don't know if you're familiar with them. We, uh, you know, started talking to them. Uh, we've talked to, uh, uh, developed a relationship with Sister Berta at um, Operation Breakthrough over on 31st and Truce, you know, and, uh, you know, she's pledged to help us out and, and, you know, working on, and to have that kind of relationship go back and forth to not just, hey, everybody come out to our Occupy things, but how can we go out and help you? You know, we've gone out and marched the picket line with some unions that were on strike. And um, and we have, you know, been trying to reach out to other occupations across the country, too, you know, to try to build that communication. On, on one hand, it's really good to have each group kind of autonomous and deal with the own dynamics of, of their city, but it is good to kind of, uh, you know, be able to talk to each other and, and uh, ride the national media attention for specific issues that are nationwide. So, yeah. I will just add on to this, and I don't have enough information to be very specific, but there has been coalition building with Midwest Occupy groups like Occupy Wichita, Occupy Iowa City. So in this general regional area, we're all trying to reach out to one another. And Occupy St. Louis, even though they don't have a physical campsite, have moved inside, they're still up and going. So we, we want to do that. Thank all of you for being here today. I pass it almost every day. I always look for somebody to do this, but there's not always somebody out there. It's been cold. I know. I know. My uh, thought and my question, has to do with legislation, and as much as a lot of people say they want government out of their lives, yeah. legislation is something that you have to work for and with all the time. Are each one of your working groups working to put forth some sort of legislation to further your efforts, to further the, uh, the work that you're doing? Many, uh, many people uh, are discounting what you are doing because you have no direct agenda. Um, as far as specific legislation, I think a lot of us think, you know, we still have to call people's attention to certain issues. Uh, we had an event a while ago, some of you were there, I know it was the uh, death of the social safety net, where we had a mock funeral for like Social Security, Medicaid, and Medicare. So I think a lot of our energies thus far have been having people focus or bring attention to legislation that's kind of coming down the pike, you know, especially things that's, you know, things that are pretty easy to understand. I mean, if I go talk to someone about Citizens United and how corporations are people, that can be a little more complex. Or, you know, if you talk about, um, you know, the mortgage fraud, and, you know, mortgage-backed securities, you know, that also is like a little complex for, you know, to like win people over. But if you talk about Social Security, Medicaid, Medicare, everybody has or knows somebody that uses those. So as far as like drafting actually actual legislation, there are some uh, people in our group that are working on something like that. But mostly I think we try to, we're still in the, I would say, the, the building phase, you know, because like we're all saying like, you know, um, Amy and Rosemary are in like two or three groups, you know, and I, I only have time for one, but we don't really, really don't have the manpower, person power to uh, really, you know, be able to, uh, you know, take on everything we would like to take on at this point. So definitely if we, you know, if we have, you know, several hundred people, we could start making groups that, you know, are drafting uh, legislation. And then, you know, another thing, I think you need some lawyers to do that, and we're, we're very lucky to have one lawyer that helps us out a lot, and we've made connections with others, but that's a really great question, you know, because that's uh, something to make definite impact, but uh, something I just don't think we, we have the personal power to address as, as full as any of us would like to at this point, maybe. But um, I know CCO is working on two pieces of legislation that we've kind of 
started pledging to help with, and it's the uh, increase in minimum wage, and then the... Um, SB 59. Yeah, the... Uh, SB 59. SB 59, the payday loan things, you know, where they're charging like four or 500% on people's loans, and those things that, you know, definitely have a have an impact on working people's lives, and so that's something that is already kind of going on that we've pledged to help out with, too. So that's a great question. And something I hope, you know, I would hope there'd be, you know, some Occupy le legislation coming coming through uh, awesome. our system soon. And watch this. Um, I, I hope that there will never be any Occupy legislation. Um, but, and I think it's unlikely, I don't know, this is debatable obviously, but I don't think it's likely that there will be for the same reason that we don't have candidates. Um, because we don't all agree, uh, quite the contrary. You know, we really do come from all parts of the political spectrum. Th this is not a vehicle for political change. This is a, a vehicle for systemic change, I think. So um, if, if we succeed, I think um, it will be easier for people and, and groups to introduce their own legislation. But I don't think that we will be as a group. But we'll see. And I just want to reiterate, because I agree with both Wesley and Amy. It sounds like a contradiction. I think that there can be legislation. It may not be under the Occupy umbrella, but we may not want it under the Occupy umbrella. But as this movement grows and people see that they want a lot, if not all, of the changes in the various areas that we're talking about, I think there will eventually legislation. Might even be on city level first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I didn't mean occupy like an occupy bill. I meant just issues that represent uh, things that we all, you know, think represent working people. So Amy and I agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, now we have Mary Lindsay, who's Mary Lindsay that's been referred to a couple times up here. Um, well, I wasn't planning on the intro, but yes, I'm with Kansas City Move to a Man, and the first thing I want to say is we started Kansas City Move to a Man in August of 2010, and there were a handful of us, and many of them, uh, of those few people are actually in the room anyway, and I love Occupy Wall Street, Occupy Kansas City. I, I mean, when you all talked about um, what was the term you used about how how um, euphoric you were or whatever. That's how it absolutely has been with our wish to amend the U.S. Constitution. That, that uh, when I look around the room now, when we're having our meetings, there are all these people who I did not know. Um, do you have a question there? Oh, yes, I do. I have a question. I apologize. Um, <laughs> Anyway, but thank you. That was really just all I wanted to say was I, okay. Um, and my question, in a way you've already addressed, and, but I want you to refine it a little bit more. I think it is critically important for an organization like ours and an entity like yours to be able to be mutually beneficial. And, um, what are your thoughts on how we can really do that beyond what we're already doing now? I mean, I, I, uh, I think we both kind of share the exact same you know, <coughs> critiques of the system. And uh, I think Move to Amend is important because it focuses on a dedicated issue. And an issue, like I was saying about the salience of other issues, that people didn't realize really how that's kind of touched their lives. And I think it's just now starting to, you know, several news programs I've heard where they've talked about, you know, the super PAC, like, you know, that wasn't an issue the last election. And people are seeing just how much money is being poured into uh, these campaigns. And, we, and I like our relationship. We work together, you know, uh, we help banners out on uh, the Occupy the Courts that they, you know, for you guys. And I, I think it's a great relationship and look forward to to uh, expanding it in the future, and then hopefully, you know, if we do have this amendment, you know, then, uh, you know, we can work on other stuff, you know, in the future. We have city legislation coming down the pipe, so 
Okay, let's have quick questions and quick answers so we can try to get uh, all the people who are asking things. All I can say, I'm glad that you are here and that there are people like you, and my question is, will you educate the people so they know the difference between socialism and communism? <laughs> so that is the most important thing that uh, nobody thinks. They all think communism. Socialism is not communism. I was raised on socialism in Germany. And uh, Sweden, Norway, and those people are not ignorant. They're very educated, and they all have socialism. But here in America, they think it's a boogeyman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I leave it up to you to educate the people, especially your younger generation. I won't be here because I'm going to be 97. And I lived through Germany with Hitler and all that commotion. So I and my family, they were all social democrats and were in politics. So I have a good notion. I see these stupid people. Ah, yeah, communism. Medic yeah, but take Medicare away and we'll see what they say. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, so, <laughs> That is a very, very good um, workshop for Tent City University. I personally want to work on it because I get that a lot. I will speak only for myself. I am a socialist. Yep, I am not a communist. So I really do think that de that definition needs to be made. Please, please come and uh, and you know either either write a pamphlet uh, that we can print and distribute or um, we can record a video. Um, what I'm saying, in other words, is if you think that we should do something, um, come and do it. Or at least come and help us do it. Anybody, anything, and that's, thank you so much for the suggestion, and I agree that it is, uh, it is necessary because people don't know the difference and it's still seen as a boogeyman. Um, but we need help. I love decision-making by consensus. That's the way of the tribe. Um, but based on my reading, it's probably unworkable above a certain number of people, and even with a small group of people, it's difficult if you don't have a long personal history, shared relationships, a building of trust and understanding, and we're running out of time, particularly with our ecological crisis undermining the life support systems of the planet. Do you, based on your experiences with consensus decision making, think it can move quickly enough to meet the enormous challenges we face. I'll start out. I don't think anything could move quickly enough because that is, the, the environment is critical. One of the things I will say about our consensus in the General Assembly, the working groups really are the ones that <coughs> bring these proposals, the smaller working groups, to the larger general assemblies. And we do need to work on it. I, I don't know if we'll be able to do it in time, but I think raising awareness so other people will get involved. And people are welcome to come not only to the general assembly, they're welcome to come to the working groups as well. I, I think if we were to introduce consensus-based decision-making on a national scale, you're right, it would never work. Um, we haven't gotten anything close to consensus in national elections yet, ever, I don't think. Um, but what we do is we start small. We start with small groups and we learn how to do it because this is new. We've never been taught how to do this. This is not how our classrooms operate, our workplaces, or you know, our families. I mean, so it, it's, it's, that's revolutionary in itself, but I feel like we can start small and learn, then it will grow and eventually we'll be able to do it in larger and larger groups. I think that's... I'm sorry, sorry. We, we've, okay. got, we've got a couple minutes left, so let's have a really quick answer and then we'll let Rita ask a quick question and maybe we'll get to Rob. I was just going to say that's one of the strengths also is a, our kind of self-analysis and, you know, being critical of ourselves and kind of streamlining how we can address these things. I mean. It's not like we come up with a system and that's the thing we do. I mean, we change it sometimes weekly, you know, to try to 
you know, streamline these things and be able to work through issues more efficiently and effectively. From the huge to the much more immediate, on March 11th, uh, the police chief, Daryl Forte, will be here. Do you, any of you have any questions that you would like to address to him? Besides possibly a big thank you for not causing any more trouble. Yeah. Okay, very quickly, Bob. Uh, my name is Robert, Rob Ryan, and uh, I've always viewed the uh, occupation as a much larger thing than it is. I was involved with it when it first uh, started up, and uh, I'm an anti issue. But uh, I view it as a potential shadow government. What do you think of that? Can you elaborate? He's, so I he knew thinks of it as a shadow, a shadow government. Is that correct? And we can spend about 30 seconds on an answer. Okay. You can discuss it some more in the library. <coughs> Yeah, I would say, you know, as far as whether it's the early stages of, you know, what could evolve to replace kind of the system we have now, you know, that's something interesting to talk about. I don't think I can really address it in uh, 30 seconds. But yeah, we can talk about that more in the library if you want. Yeah. Th okay. Thank you so much for coming, and we already gave you your honorarium. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Uh, next week we're going to have uh, Missouri Representative Bob Nance talking about the problems of food stamps.